You might say, Pastor, I'm not seeing a lot of fruit right now. I would say, you might need to start learning something new. You might need some new information. Many times the miracle you're searching for with your children or with your job or with your money, the miracle you're searching for comes to you in the form of information, wisdom, an answer you didn't know was available. Welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Jason Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Let's pray and get right into it. Father God, I thank you and praise you for this time that you open up our hearts to receive your word, that your word is manna, it's bread, it's practical, it's the word of life. Lord, your word is also seed, plants deep in the good soil of our hearts, produces change in us. Holy Spirit, be our teacher, teach us what we need to know. Prepare us for what is coming in our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Today, I want to talk to you about how to get out of a rut by remaining teachable. We can increase through life, or we can stay stagnant. We can always be learning. That's really what I'm talking about today, is positioning ourselves as a student, and always be on the increase, growing, teachable. Humility says, I don't really know everything. Pride says, I already know all that. I know everything there is to know about marriage. I I don't need somebody to tell me how to raise my kids. I know what I'm doing. I don't need somebody to teach me my job. I know my job. We We stop learning when we get that way. We get hard. And it's better to always be increasing. Remember when you were in school, high school, maybe some, some, some of you here still in school, college? When you're learning, we remember those years as kind of the golden years, the amazing years. Why? Because we were in a state of discovery. Constantly learning energizes the mind. And when you learn something new, suddenly the dream that seemed unattainable might come into view. Suddenly the door you didn't even know was right next to you, when you get new information, it appears. New worlds open up to us when we're in a state of learning, buying books, reading, discovering life, being in the Word of God. One of the greatest sports comebacks in history belongs to a man named Ben Hogan. Ben Hogan, championship golfer, winning, top of his game. But on February 2nd of 1949, on Groundhog Day, he was driving home from a tournament, and he was in Texas. It was a foggy night, and he had a head-on collision with a Greyhound bus. He found himself in the hospital for over two months, crushed ribs, fractured legs, broken collarbone. The doctors at one point said he wouldn't live, probably would never walk again, certainly would never play golf again. But here's the thing about Ben Hogan. 16 months later, Ben Hogan not only returned to golf, but he won the U.S. Open. He would go on to win five majors and 10 championships. He's a story of a comeback. What could we learn from Ben Hogan was that he never stopped learning. When he took back to the golf course, he had to retrain everything he already knew. The body didn't work the same way it used to. The legs were in pain, the ligaments were different, the collarbone, the ribs, everything was out of place and out of order. He had to retrain himself his golf swing. And experts say, that because of his legs and the pain he was in, he added something new to his swing, kind of a coiling with the legs that professional golfers still train in today, this part of their swing. There's an uncoiling of the legs that increases the speed. He was able to hit the ball further. And experts say that Ben Hogan's swing actually improved after his accident. What was the key for Ben Hogan? He didn't not just give up, but he kept learning. He kept increasing. He kept growing. 2 Peter chapter 1 says it this way, Make every effort, giving all diligence, add to your faith, say add, add to your faith virtue or goodness, add to your goodness self-control, add to your self-control perseverance, add to your perseverance godliness, add to your godliness brotherly kindness. What are we doing? We're adding a lot of stuff. Add to your brotherly kindness love. And then it goes on to say, for if you possess these things, if you have them, if they're yours, and you abound, abound means I'm increasing, I'm growing in these things. Never stop growing is what it's saying to you. Never stop adding. Never feel like you've already arrived in what you know. But keep increasing. That requires humility. It says this, that you will be neither barren 
nor unfruitful. Now, barren means I'm, I'm not conceiving. So he says, you're going to keep conceiving as long as you're still increasing. You're still growing. You haven't arrived yet, but you're still increasing. You'll keep conceiving. Why? Because new word is coming in you. New information, this new seed is coming in you, and you're receiving it, not on hard ground, but on good ground. And not only will you keep conceiving, you're going to keep bearing fruit. You're going to keep increasing. And this is what we want. We don't want to grow stagnant. You might say, Pastor, I'm not seeing a lot of fruit right now. I would say, you might need to start learning something new. You might need some new information. Many times the miracle you're searching for with your children or with your job or with your money, the miracle you're searching for comes to you in the form of information, wisdom, an answer you didn't know was available. It says it this way in James in chapter 1, put aside wickedness and filthiness, but in humility, say humility, humility, humility is that, that, that moment when you say, you know what, I don't know. I don't know. It's a powerful thing when we can admit to ourselves and others that we don't have the right answer. I don't know what I'm doing. That's humility. I don't know how to handle this. When in humility I receive the word implanted, the best truth is received in the soil of a problem. When you face a problem and you're like, I don't know what to do with this problem, you're ready for truth. You're ready for some kind of answer. You're ready to start asking questions. What are you doing? You're receiving the seed into the good, soft soil of humility. I don't have all the answers, but I'm ready. When I receive with humility the implanted word of God, it has the power to save my soul. Salvation for the soul. Put the scripture back up. It has the power for salvation unto the soul. It doesn't mean that your soul is now going to be eternal. You received eternal life when you received Christ. You're already going to heaven. What God's saying is that your soul still has wrong thoughts. It still has wrong emotions. It still makes wrong choices. And when you start to receive the salvation of your soul through the imparted word of God, it means you're receiving the right thoughts. You're receiving the right emotions. You're starting to walk in the right decisions. And Ben Hogan is a picture of us. When we got born again, it's kind of like we were hit by a, by a greyhound bus, if you will. We were crucified in Christ in that moment. And what do I mean? I mean that everything you knew up till that moment would have to be relearned. All of your philosophies before you knew Christ, you found out, don't work. Everything you thought was true wasn't true. All of your strategies for life had to be erased and started over. And God gives you this great big book called the Word of God. And in it are 66 books of increase. 66 books of growing, 728,000 life-giving words. And every single word in Scripture full of power, purpose, principles, patterns, and promises for your life. It's all in there. And God is saying you'll increase in fruitfulness when you're increasing in your learning, when you're humble and receiving that imparted word of God. That's important stuff. There was a, a king in the in Judah, in the book of 2 Chronicles talks about him. And I want to talk about him for a second in verse 26. Uzziah, he became king when he was 16 years old. He's one of the children of, of David, if you follow the lineage up. And Uzziah is king of 16 years old. The Bible says that he sought the Lord and received instruction or was instructed by Zechariah in the fear of God. So here the Bible equates seek God with be instructed. When I'm instructed, that's a recognition that I don't have all the answers. When I look at something and I don't know how to build it or grow it, I need what? Instructions. So it says he was instructed in the fear of the Lord by Zechariah. And it says this, as long as he sought the Lord, in other words, as long as he was staying in a position of humility and being teachable, that God gave him success. Now, one day, Uzziah became very powerful. Of course he would, because as we increase and God gives us success, we become very powerful. God elevates us, and look what happens. It says that after Uzziah became powerful, his pride, say pride, led to his downfall. How does pride lead to a downfall? It's when I stop increasing. I already know everything. Nobody can teach me nothing. Nobody's going to help me. I don't need help with my kids. I don't need help in my marriage. I know what I'm doing. I don't need help in my job. I don't need people to tell me what to do anymore. i got to figure it out. All these people out here, they're a bunch of yum-yums. They don't know what they're doing. They can't give me jack. And so I, that's, uh, that's in the Hebrew for pride. 
Jack, they can't give me Jack, led to his downfall. And it goes on to say that he went into the temple with a censer. Now, that's a, a thing you would burn incenses to, but only the priest was allowed to do this. Man, ask the court, re rebellion of Korah. Ask Aaron's two sons. Only the priests were supposed to be burning census, uh, incense. But the king walks in with it, and the priest goes, no, 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 you can't do that. And they began to instruct him, and the guy who used to be teachable got angry. Don't you tell me what I can or can't do. The Bible says as he threw a fit that leprosy appeared on his forehead. Now, that's a picture. That picture is that pride becomes a disease on the mind that will keep you from learning. And when you had, as he had leprosy, you can't be in the temple with leprosy, so he, they had to put him out of the temple. And pride will do that to us. It causes us to have to leave everything that's a learning place. Everything that's a growing place, pride will cause us to leave it. And suddenly, we're out of God's house with that leprosy of the mind, that disease of pride, saying, those pastors, those teachers, those fathers and mothers of the spirit, the mothers and fathers that are spiritual to us, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to teach the word of God. They're not rightly dividing it. And all those people that go to churches, they're a bunch of sinners. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And pride drives you out of the very place that could heal you, out of the place that could grow you, out of the place that could give you great success. You find yourself, I can't go to church anymore because I know more than all those people. Then when you had leprosy, you were also were driven out of the city. Pride will do the same thing. And suddenly, you can't get along with your neighbors anymore. They're a bunch of sinners. You can't get along. You get very judgmental. I can't get along even with my own family anymore. I can't get along with my coworkers. I can't hold down this job. What happens? Things are getting worse and worse, and I'm isolating myself. But the Bible teaches me to esteem others as more valuable than myself. What's that? To stay humble to be teachable, to recognize that I can still learn some things. When I was uh, uh, in the 10th grade, I was into wrestling. Before I got heavily into music, I was into wrestling. And so uh, in the, I'd wrestled in the 8th grade and was super successful. In the 9th grade, I was super successful as a wrestler. I had a great coach, loved him. When I got into the 10th grade, it was, it was and you went to my high school, both of you. And, well, when I got into the 10th grade, you'll remember the story probably, uh, I was, uh, got a new coach. And the new coach had all these new ways of doing things, and I didn't like what he was doing. And I'll give you a, a quick uh, synopsis of where I'm headed. The Gilbert High School, the wrestling, uh, you had to wrestle against your own uh, uh, people on the team. People were on the team with you. You had to wrestle in your weight class to see who would wrestle varsity in the first meet. So the first meet was approaching, and in Gilbert High School, it's such a big deal with wrestling that you had to wrestle in front of the entire high school for the first time with the person in your weight class to see who would win to go on to the first meet, wrestle varsity, which meant you would get a letterman's jacket, which is a big deal, and all this glory in front of the whole school. So there was a kid in my weight class. I, I don't know if you know this about me, but you probably can't tell, but I was very small back then. <laughs> there was only one kid in my weight class, and he was in the ninth grade. He came up from the junior high to wrestle with the high schoolers in the, in the tenth grade. And so I would spar against this guy, new coach. I didn't like his techniques. What's wrong with the old coach? I liked my old coach. I was a winner. I already knew how to win. I already knew all the moves. I was good. I didn't need to learn. So I wouldn't listen. I wasn't learning. And this kid I was sparring against, I kept beating him, and I kept beating him, and I thought, I'm, I'm good. In front of the whole school, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to win. I'm going to go on to be varsity. I'm going to get my letter. Well, on that day, I walk out in front of the whole school, big assembly. I was the first one to wrestle because of my weight class. I went out there against this kid. And what I didn't know is that while I had stopped growing, he was secretly learning and applying all these new skills. And every time he wrestled against me, he was just playing, playing. He was just, he just fall, he'd let me win. He was just letting me win. I didn't know this. While he was still increasing and I wasn't, he passed me up. And in front of the entire school that day, he pinned me in the first minute. And he got all the cheering. A ninth grader had beat a tenth grader. Jason Anderson just went down. It was the biggest, everyone cheering, going crazy. All the favor and the glory went to the guy who had kept learning. What happened to me? Come on, say, aw. Yeah, <laughs> you don't care. I can tell. <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson that day. I learned never stop increasing, never stop growing. And it might happen to you. You work a job, the new boss comes in. Man, you know more than the boss. You know more than what he's up to. He starts to change. She starts to change the way everything works. 
She starts to change the systems, whatever's happening. And what are you doing? You're resisting the change. They don't know what they're doing. I know better. I've been in this company for years. They're brand new. I'm not going to learn anything from that person. Don't do that. Be humble. Don't be a know-it-all. Learn the new things. A new software comes in. I don't want to learn the new software. I know the old software. What was wrong with the old software? Don't do that. Be teachable. In your job, like my dad used to tell me, learn not only your own job, but grow into everybody's job around you. Learn what your boss is doing. Have your eyes wide open and be instructable and teachable because this is a principle of God that when I'm teachable, when I'm increasing in every arena of my life, I begin to conceive the things of God and I become fruitful in the things of God. I'm going to see increase in my life. I'm going to see success. I'm going to have answers revealed to me. Come on and give the Lord some praise right there. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1 is a story of of Moses and his brother and sister. Now they had left Egypt and they were in the wilderness and, and they weren't in the promised land yet and Moses had brought down the commands of God from the Mount Sinai. And, and here in this particular story, Moses' brother, who Aaron, happened to be the high priest and his sister Miriam, they began to talk against Moses, chapter 12 and verse 1, because of his Cushite wife. He had married a Cushite. They were mad at him because of who he married. He married a foreigner. In, in the Bible, it, it shows some different places where you're really not supposed to marry a foreigner. And so they were starting to talk against him. I didn't agree with the way, what he did. Now watch this. And they said this. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses, they asked. Hasn't he also spoken through us? What they did was they silenced Moses' voice in their life. No longer teachable for Moses. Moses was the mouthpiece of God. I'm not teachable from that man. He can't tell me what to do because I disagree with what he did in his life. Pride has a symptom called judgment. It looks at someone else's humanity and says, I can't learn from you because I see your weakness. I see something you've done in your life I disagree with, whether you said it or whether you did it, and now I can't listen to you anymore. Well, wouldn't you know that God would, of course, side with Moses? And God had to call Miriam and Aaron in, and there was trouble. Don't you know I speak to Moses face to face? How dare you? Don't you do this? But then this is what the Lord says. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. You see, God picks somebody who had humility, somebody who wouldn't be arrogant and know everything. Even when we find Moses being asked to be the servant and mouthpiece of God, Moses was like, I think you got the wrong guy. I think you need somebody else. That humility excited God because he knows that's a teachable person. I can teach them and grow them and increase them. Pride is the hard heart, the hard ground. It can't grow the things of God up. Joshua did not judge Moses during this period. Joshua didn't judge him for who he married. He didn't judge him for being a murderer. That Moses, he was a murderer. No, Joshua continued to listen. Somebody who can see the weaknesses and humanity of another person, to see the mistakes, but still recognize that God can still use that person. Because here's the reality that we serve a God who wrote us a Bible. And in that Bible, he gave us a ton of heroes who were all broken, who were all full of sin sometimes, who were all human at moments and did wrong things. And God calls them heroes of the faith. Even people like Samson who lived a life of sin, God calls in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews a hero of the faith. You see the the wrong things that we do and say and our weaknesses do not discredit or disqualify or God does not discard us because we made a mistake. And I'm, so I'm warning us right now as a body of believers, do not fall into the trap that the world has fallen into. The world has gotten into a place right now where if you say something I don't agree with or you've done something that I think has shown human weakness, that I discredit you, I discard you, and I disqualify you. But that is not our God. That is not the example our Jesus has set for us. So separate yourself from that. Be like Joshua. He said, well, that's how the world is. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Don't be conformed to this pattern of the world that's rejecting and judging people. Jesus is the only righteous judge. Don't discard people because they've shown some humanity. Praise God that our Jesus did not discard the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. He did not discard the greedy swindler who climbed up in the sycamore that tree to see Jesus. 
He did not discard his servant David, the beloved David, who had a heart after God, even though he made a big mistake, a huge one. He had adultery with his friend's wife, got her pregnant, pulled back from the friend in battle so that the friend would die in battle. David made a big mistake, but God did not discredit him or disqualify him for the mistake. The negative things that he did did not disqualify the positive fruit that he left on this planet. And we don't want to get into the trap of judging people and discrediting the good that God can speak through somebody because the Psalms that David wrote are still in the word of God. And God was saying, yeah, he was human, but I spoke through him. I used him. And that should excite all of us that even in our own humanity, come on, somebody, even in our own weakness, that God will still speak through us. The God who said, I give wisdom to anyone who will ask without finding fault. And we get ourselves in the trap of saying, I find fault in you, and I find fault in you, and we miss the wisdom of God that can come out of that man and come out of that woman because God has poured his spirit upon all flesh and anybody who would believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the living God. God can speak through all these people. When, when we're in within earshot of people that God has opened our ears to, now not everybody that God opens our ears to is speaking the word of God, and we know that. You have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you to be your teacher. People are not your teacher. But when I open my ears to what men and women who have gone before me is, are saying, and God has positioned me around those people, I can learn and grow. I consider the story of, of Jethro, the priest of Midian, who served a foreign god, who was a godless man, he came and shared with Moses, who's meeting with God face to face. And Jethro says to Moses, you know, this is how you should run the nation. Delegate, have leaders, and set up systems here. And Moses listened to Jethro. God was speaking through his father-in-law into Moses' life. But Moses was teachable. He opened his ears to hear it. I have an amazing father-in-law. He's a great businessman, an amazing father, a wonderful husband, a great example to me. One day he walks into my house and we're having dinner and uh, we had already told them that we were selling our house. Now I had done all the market research of pricing. I know real estate. I've handled the real estate for the church for many years. I have a finance degree from ASU. I had done the market analysis. I had met with the realtor. We had set the right price. But my father-in-law walked in. He said, I heard you're selling the house. You should sell it for this price. And he set a price. And man, I'll tell you, my ears opened. I thought, I'm having a moment here. He just prophesied into this house. I could have said, you know what? I know a lot about real estate. I've already done the market research. I've done the comps. I've met with the realtor. I've done it all. This is the right price. But instead, I listened to the voice. I was teachable, and I was humble in that moment. And I said, I think God's talking through you. And I changed the price. Even the realtor, who's a believer and loves God, questioned it a few times. Like, wait, wait that's way too high. But... I believe with you. I'll stand in agreement with you. And so we believe for that price, and it sold for that price. It put an additional $50,000 in my pocket. Somebody say amen. You see, being teachable and humble will make us fruitful. When we're listening to the right voice, you say, well, what are they going to teach me? What are they gonna, what's that person going to share with me? I was out in the foyer, and there was a five-year-old. And this five-year-old looked up at me and said, Pastor Jason, what? I know something you don't know. You know how kids do this? I know something you don't know. I know something. I was like, what do you know that I don't know? And she said, I know how to make the best chocolate chip cookies you've ever had. <laughs> you know, we can learn something from anybody. I could have been like, listen, I'm 49 years old. <laughs> I'm 49 years old. There's no way a five-year-old knows something I don't know. I could have said that. Pastor Hage called me on Thursday. He was sharing. He just loves you guys so much. And we were just talking about his weekend here. And I'd watched all the streams. And, and he said, Pastor Jason, I got to tell you something, though. I had lunch with your dad on Monday. And I want you to know something. I shared with him a problem that I've been having. I told him, I don't know what to do with this, Pastor Tom. And he said, your dad shared with me for 30 minutes. He immediately knew. He began to speak into my life the word of God. And in 30 minutes, he gave me the answer and direction I needed. He said, I want you to know it changed my life 
and I told your dad, you've got to come here and teach my entire church the word you just spoke to me. Now, here's my point. Pastor Steve Hage is still increasing. He's still humble. He positioned himself as a student to ask somebody who's gone before him, how do I do this? What do I do? The generation that came after Joshua, the Bible says, they did not neither know the Lord nor what he had done. And I believe it's because the generation that came after Joshua wasn't asking the generation of Joshua, hey, how do I do courage? How do we be brave? How do I miss distractions? How did you guys take the territory? Tell us what happened in Egypt. We've got to learn and not say, well, okay, boomer, and discard a whole generation because we get into pride. But instead, to look to the generations and the fathers and mothers and spiritual fathers and mothers who have gone before us with honor and say, what do you know that I don't know? My ears are open. Pastor Steve Hage knows the Bible as well as anybody I've ever met. He's very, very successful. He has a I would say almost all the answers every time I ask him a question, and yet he humbled himself. He went to Dr. Tom, how do I do this? I'm not sure what to do, and he got his answer. And so many times there's increase in fruitfulness just waiting for you behind a question. How? What? When I ask a question, I'm humbling myself. I don't know how to do this. It's okay that I don't know how to do this. I want to learn something right now. The tale of two pharaohs. The first pharaoh, he was in a bind. He had had a dream. It looked like something was going to happen bad in his nation, Egypt, and he didn't know what to do. So he called and asked for a prisoner, a former slave, a foreigner, to come up and explain to the highest man in the land how to overcome his dream, to interpret the dream and what to do with it. That's humility, a great leader. And you know what happened to his nation as he called Joseph out of the prison and listened to the wisdom of a prisoner? You know what happened to this humble man? Is that his nation became the most prosperous and wealthy nation in all of the world because he listened. The second Pharaoh, a few generations later, he was talking to a guy named Moses. The Bible says that his heart was hard. And Moses said, you better let these people go. But he wouldn't do it. And what happened? Plague after plague, 10 plagues in his life, cost him his firstborn, cost him his entire army, and all of Egypt was plundered by Israel of all their gold and all their treasures in one day. What happened? Wasn't teachable, wasn't listening, couldn't increase. The same thing can happen to you and I. We can become hard. I already know all that. I don't need anyone to instruct me. Or we can commit ourselves to a life of learning, to being open, to being teachable. When Gideon was on the night before his big battle, and Gideon was going to face an army larger than could be counted camels of sea on the seashore. That's what the Bible says. It was a huge army. It was impossible. He only had 300 men. And the night that God said, okay, go and attack him, Gideon was still afraid. And the Bible says God said, but Gideon, if you're still afraid, go down to the enemy camp and listen to what they're saying. It was an act of humility that Gideon, the general of the army, would say, you know what, I am still afraid. God's not just looking for people who are never afraid, who never show human weakness, who are never humble. God's looking for people that are willing to be real and say, I don't have the answer. I don't know what to do. I know you've called me to lead. I know you called me to be strong. But right now, I'm not feeling that strong. And then ask the question, God, I'm still afraid. And God says, if you're still afraid, go down to the enemy camp and listen to what they're saying. And even from the enemy camp, God can give you the word that you're looking for. And just one word, one of the, one of the enemy had a dream. I saw a loaf of bread rolling down and crushing our army, crushing our tents. And they said, this can only be the sword of Gideon. And Gideon went back feeling strong when he heard about that dream. And I want you to know this, that if you just humble yourself and be teachable in life and be willing to learn, you might just be one revelation from your big victory like Gideon was. Just one revelation being forever free of fear. Just one bit of wisdom can change your finances. Just one word from God can turn your marriage around. Just one word from God can raise your children up in the ways of the Lord. Just one seed of God, one life-giving, breathed word of God can change everything in your life. Our job is just to be teachable, to be humble, to be willing to learn. 
and like the Pharaoh to ask questions. Be willing to ask. Set your heart to a life of learning. Set your life on a trajectory of always gaining new information. Learn everything around you. Get that knowledge. Add to your life. And God promises you this. You will conceive the things of God. Fruitfulness is coming to you in big ways. New worlds are going to get opened up to you. New doors that you didn't know were already there are going to appear. The dreams that are in your heart that seem so far away suddenly are going to come into view. In Jesus' name. And if you receive it, shout out, I believe it. Amen. Amen. Um, if you were to face eternity today, you don't know what eternity looks like for you, and you're not sure what your relationship with God looks like. And if that's you, I want to pray for you. And this is an opportunity for you to, to receive Jesus. See, here's the good news for you. God already offered the free gift of salvation to anyone who would believe. He said it this way, Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God will not perish but have everlasting life. And it's really about making him the Lord of your life. Kind of like getting hit with a Greyhound bus and having everything erased and starting over. It's a better life. It's the best life God has for you. The old way didn't work anyways. God's got a new way for you. And if you're ready for that, just say this prayer and choose Jesus. Everyone's going to repeat after me to make it easy for those who are saying it for the first time. Dear Father God, forgive me of all my sin. And Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're the only Son of God who died for my sins, rose from the dead. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the very first time, if you're part of our online family, call the number on your screen right now, 480-937-2330. They're going to give you a Bible, ask you any questions you might have. They're going to, they're, they're, you're going to ask them questions you might have, and they're going to pray for you.